this time I'd call on uh, Mr. Ken Wilson with, with Aptum Coastal Planning and Engineering to uh, give us his, our beach uh, status report. Good morning, Ken. Good morning. I think it's still morning, yeah. I will say this before, before he starts. We had, we had asked Mr. Mr. Wilson to take a look at his original uh, presentation he made to us, and we had questions about it, and he, he's, I think that since that time has addressed them and will talk to us about it today. It's all yours. Thanks. Yeah, back, right back before the holidays, I got a chance to you know, talk to talk to some of the new council a little bit about some of the studies that we had done in the past, uh, answer a lot of questions. We actually, we got, we got a lot of questions, which I think was, um, you know, prompted by some of the you know public comment that that was submitted after the last time uh, we were up here presenting in September, um, some of the uh, the update studies that we've done in the past. So, um, you know, council were aware of those concerns by the citizenry. They asked a lot of good questions. Um, you know, sort of challenged us. Sometimes we're so used to looking at these graphs and graphics. Um, you know, there were a lot of specific questions or comments about, you know, can we change this? Can we make this a little bit more understandable? And then they also specifically, we, we had a lot of discussion about the, um, the, the potential for placing sand up on the, the northern uh, section of beach that was not included in the original assessment. So um, I'm going to go through that a little bit today. A little bit of a, uh, just an outline, a, 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 you know, just to get ramped up, a little bit of the background on how we got here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this addendum, which is basically what uh, we were asked to provide an addendum to the existing studies that we have done that look at a couple of new options for that northern end. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the revised beach management plan goals. Um, the last speaker talked a lot about making sure when you're, when you're going through this hiring process, making sure that the consultant understands um, what this town needs. We went through a very similar process. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very important process to understand um, you know, what, what, are you, what are you looking for. Um, the gentleman in the public comment period talking about the FRF. The FRF ha has a lot of great data, much of which we've incorporated into our studies. Um, and they certainly have qualified individuals that could come here and give you a third party um, a, opinion on that, a technical opinion of the work that we've done. But it's very important, there, there isn't a, there isn't a textbook you could go to to say, do I need beach nourishment? You know, open up, take this test, here's your answer. Uh, it's, a, it's a subjective, um, discretionary type of, uh, type of analysis and type of an answer. And we've, been, we've tried to be very transparent in understanding what the goals of the town are and why you'd even ask the question whether you need beach nourishment and tried very hard to, you know, in very concrete, very black and white terms, describe to you the analysis we've gone through to try to answer that question for you. Uh, ultimately, it will be a discretionary decision by council. It is a very difficult decision to make. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, number four, the methods that we use for determining this term sufficient usable beach. You'll hear me talk about that a lot today. That was the term that we used uh, up on that northern section to try to better understand what the goals of a beach project would be up, up on the northern part of the town. And then in the end, I'll summarize these additional options. So a little bit of background. Um, again, those, those three sub-bullet points under stated goals, these are the original goals that Aptum helped develop um, with some feedback from past councils, past town managers to try to understand why were you asking the question of do we need beach nourishment? These, this was our understanding of um, what the town wanted to provide in a beach management plan and whether or not existing conditions provided that was the determination we used to say, okay, do you need beach nourishment or do you not need beach nourishment? Um, we had provided an ori original study back in December 2018. That study used data that was collected uh, in December of 2017. Um, the council was discussing a lot of, um, you know, a, a, a lot of decisions whether to move forward with this. Uh, part of our contract was to conduct an updated beach profile survey, so a new conditional survey since that December 2017 survey. That one was done in May 2019. And then we used that new conditional data, that new beach data, to update the analysis that we had provided in December 2018. That report is what I presented the last time I was here in September of 2019. 
All right, so in that report, again, think of those three goals that were up there. A lot of it has to do with providing um, you know, sufficient or uh, acceptable level of storm damage reduction. Uh, we did a lot of analysis to determine how much volume do we need in the system to provide a, a specific level of storm damage reduction. And we talked a little bit about uh, a, what we called the volume envelope. So basically measuring the amount of sand from the back side of the dune, the landward side of the dune, all the way out to what we call the depth of closure, which is around 24 feet um, out, out in the water, and quantifying that amount of volume. And we came up, through our analysis, we came up with a number that we said, in order to provide this, this, um, you know, this acceptable level of storm damage reduction, we want to have this much volume in place. So it was very easy to look at the rest of the beach and say, is this volume that we've set as our target already in place? If it is, there's probably not a need for beach nourishment. If we're under that volume, that, you know, there was a recommendation for beach nourishment. So that was how that first analysis was conducted. So what came out of that first analysis was two different options, which basically suggested that the area where we did not meet that, that volume envelope number that I just talked about was um, in, this, in this section where we've got a, a larger fill, a, 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 um, a thicker, density, a wider density of beach fill. Um, that, that point is uh, go here. Um, trying to zoom in on these maps to, 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 to let you have a better understanding of what we're talking about. The northern boundary of that is right at the, if you went down the end of 3rd Avenue and the, and the road that runs parallel to shore, the northern tip of that road is basically the, the northern extent of where those first options suggested sand would be filled or placed. The southern boundary of that wider section of Beachville um, is, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, uh, just a little south of Chickahawk Trail. I'd say it's probably five or six houses south of where Chickahawk Trail comes out onto Ocean Boulevard. And then we also provided, or we also recommended uh, a transition section of fill between what we suspected um, that the Kitty Hawk uh, project would look like in 2022 and the end of where that, that Beachville was, uh, was proposed in Southern Shores. So that was, uh, those options were presented in that original study back in December 2018. We conducted that 2019 beach profile survey. We updated the analysis. Our analysis showed that based on the 2017, December 2017 beach profiles and the May 2019 beach profiles, basically a year and a half's worth of time, that in that northern section, when I say northern section, let me back up just a second. The northern portion is that portion of the project of the of the town north of Third Avenue. From, so from north, from Third Avenue north to the town of Duck, is the northern portion. The main placement area that I just talked about, basically from Chickahawk Trail to Third, and then from Chickahawk Trail south, is that transition area. All right, so. Looking at those three zones, in that northern portion, in that 18-month period between December 2017 and May 2019, measuring that volume that was in that, that yellow volume envelope that I showed you. So this isn't just the dry sand beach. This is the, all the sand in the system out to a depth of 24 feet. That northern section actually gained about 5.5 cubic yards per linear foot per year. The central section also gained some sand. This is again the area where we were proposing to put the beach fill to achieve that storm damage uh, reduction design. Um, it actually gained some sand during that same period of time, which allowed us to decrease the design volume we were recommending. And then that transitional area, the area to the south, actually lost um, the most sand during that same period. And so we actually boosted up a little bit the volume density in that transition area. And we provided those updates, again, back in September of 2019. These were the two updates that we provided. Um, one just aside as to what, what are the difference between these two options, option one and option three is the way that we're referring to them right now. Um, when we went through and did that analysis to figure out how much volume we need in that volume envelope, one of the, the, the first analysis considered existing sea level conditions today. And that's option one, is, is designed to try to achieve um, storm damage reduction from a storm that was similar to Hurricane Isabel 
if it were to strike today with today's sea level rise, okay, to today's sea levels. Option three basically fast forwards 30 years into the future, uses projections that the state of North Carolina has adopted for sea level rise and says if Hurricane Isabel hit 30 years from now, this is the level of storm damage reduction we would want to achieve. And so that's why option three costs more. That's why option three requires more volume. All right. So like I said, we had that discussion um, right before the holidays. There was a lot of discussion, a lot of public input about um, the need for sufficient usable sand up on the north end of town. Um, a lot of question, questions raised, some comments about um, trying to improve the way that we present these results to the, to, to the public. So we came up with this scope of work for, to, to provide an addendum. And the first step was to review and assist the town with revising the current goals, those goals of why, why we may consider beach nourishment, uh, goals and objectives of the beach management plan, specifically to include the importance of maintaining that term sufficient usable beach throughout the town. We also wanted to develop an additional alternative that provided sand along the entire ocean front of the town. Um, a caveat to that, one of, the, one of the limitations or the requests that, that council made at that point in time was to try to keep that option as close as possible to the price point of the original option one. So somewhere in that $14 million, um, $14 million range. Um, so we've tried to do that for, option, for, for number two. Uh, number three, develop an addendum to the beach management plan that includes updated goals, the additional options including cost estimates and updated recommendations. Uh, that, that A draft of that document was provided last week to the town. I believe it's on the website. We talked to a gentleman earlier that had a, a copy of it. So that's been, uh, uh, that, that's, that's been, been shared. And then finally this, this meeting today to present to a public, uh, to, to, to council and to the public forum and I will say that, that um, I, I, you know, I, I, I agree with this idea of having this public forum, this opportunity to, um, to, to provide comments, to ask questions. Um, we have been through this very same process with your neighbors to the north, your neighbors to the south, um, other communities in North Carolina, other communities in Florida. Uh, every community goes through the same process where there are a lot of questions. This is a new concept to a lot of folks trying to understand it. There is a lot of money. You guys are trying to prioritize money. So we are very willing and used to being very open and transparent, answering your questions, answering questions from the general public. Happy to do that through this process. And I think it's really important to do that through the process. Even the idea of um, you know, a, a third party like the Corps of, the Corps of Engineers coming in and reviewing our, our information. Uh, we've been through that process before where we've worked with other public and private organizations that, that wanted to conduct a technical review of our work. So. so the revised beach management plan goals, that first, that, that number one on the previous slide. So again, under one, two, and three up there are those initial goals that we set up um, with the past council and past um, town manager to try to understand, all right, well, why would we do beach nourishment? What are we trying to achieve with the beach management plan? Again, a lot of that is geared towards storm damage reduction, storm damage reduction. Um, number three, we wanted to revise that. <clears throat> we were looking at adding another goal, but the cleanest way of doing that seemed to be to modify number three and say that now we want to maintain a healthy beach that provides sufficient usable beach in bold and supports valuable shorebird and sea turtle nesting habitat. Um, I want to say that th this is in that draft document that we provided. This has not been formally approved by council. This was our first draft, our recommendation to you all as to this may be a clean way of incorporating that need, that desire for sufficient usable beach into the goals of the beach management plan. So these have not, th that, that number three has not been formally adopted by, by council at this point in time. It's more of our recommendation. Excuse me. So <clears throat> defining the term sufficient usable beach is not a, a widely accepted term. Uh, it's, it's somewhat subjective. So it was our job to try to figure out how to make this subjective term an objective term that we could measure in some way. So um, this is just a picture of, the, of I think the last time that I was up here. 
Um, you know, this is, this is basically the problem area, the, the area that there's been a lot of public comment about. This is right at the Hillcrest Access, saying, you know, there isn't a whole lot of usable beach, but how do we define usable beach? Do we just go out there at any given time and measure that distance from the dune to the water line? We know that based on the, the, the wave conditions, that water line changes, the tides change, you know, twice a day we have high tides and low tides, you know, how do we objectively measure that distance? And so a lot of times, you, you all have seen this graphic in the past, a lot of times we'll show this very neat beach nourishment cartoon and we've got a very flat beach and we can say, oh, we want to make this design beach, that flat part that you see right here. We want this flat part to be 50 feet wide or 60 feet wide or 80 feet wide. Um, but that's not how a beach looks. This is how a beach looks um, when we're looking at it graphically in, in beach profile data. So we wanted to un understand, all right, well, how do we come up with what the usable beach is there so that we can uh, evaluate how, how it is in the north end, how it is in other ends. So <clears throat> we, we took a look at a couple of different features, some aerial photos, um, some, some past LIDAR data, and we came up to the conclusion that something that the, that the town could grasp onto, the general public could really grasp onto, is this concept of using the plus 12 foot contour um, reference to NAVD88, it's a, it's a vertical datum, a survey datum, and usually that, that point is right around the, the toe of the dune. If you went out there and looked at the toe of the dune or in that previous picture where there's not a really good defined toe of dune, it's probably around where that edge of vegetation starts at the bottom of the scarp or at the bottom of the dune. And that goes out to the plus four foot contour, which typically probably lines up with where your wet dry line is. If you walked out on the beach and you saw where that swash zone comes up, and you've got that line of where the wet sand and the dry sand starts, in general, that's probably around that four foot contour. So we wanted to use those two, those two points to assess the width of the beach. All right, so what does that look like if I were out on the beach? Um, this photo here is taken, uh, let me see here, 15. This photo is taken between like Porpoise and Trout Lane. Uh, so just a little north of where the, the roads diverge, south of, um, uh, south of Dolphin. So this would show sort of how, how you would measure that distance if you were actually out there on the beach, um, that approximate plus 12 foot contour line up there around the dune, and then that plus four foot contour down there around where the wet dry line uh, is. And then that, line, that, that distance could be measured to come up with what we would define in this, in this case as usable beach. Here's another example where the usable beach is obviously smaller. Um, this is up uh, around that Hillcrest area again. Um, you know, this, this area was interesting when I went to it because if you, you folks that walk the beach a lot, you see that pattern of the beach kind of goes up and down and up and down. And when you look at the contours, that means it kind of gives you a sawtooth edge as you go down the beach. So, you know, depending on where that profile is, where is that plus four foot contour, it, it changes somewhat. Um, but again, trying to hit, trying to trying to identify landmarks that the general public could, you know, wrap their their head around that that plus 12 foot contour and the plus 4 foot contour. So we took all of the data that we had from May 2019 and we put it on a graph. Okay, so the the bottom is basically our position along the shoreline. The left side of that page is the northern boundary, the town of Duck. The south side of that page is all the way down in Kill Double Hills around East Balm Street. That's the limits of how far south we monitor the project that was built back in 2017. And we have graphed um, every one of those profiles that we survey at, at roughly 1,000 foot increments. We have graphed that usable beach width. So from the plus 12 to the plus 4 foot contour on every one of those profiles, that's the graph that you're looking at here. All right, so let's give us a few landmarks to make more sense out of this graphic. All right, so you've got these red lines that are the dividing lines between the towns. So this, is, this would be around where the pier is here at, between Kitty Hawk and Southern Shores. Uh, this green arrow is pointing to where that Chickahawk Trail would, would be, the intersection of Chickahawk Trail. That, that photo that I had just sent showed you as an example between Trout and Porpoise Run, that, that picture was taken right here. Third Avenue, which is kind of the dividing line of where we talked about a storm damage reduction project versus what might be going on in the northern part of the town where we're, we have some issues with, with a lack of sufficient usable beach. 
Um, that would be this arrow pointing to Third Avenue. And then finally, the Hillcrest access point, uh, again, called out by this last green arrow. So once we had all of this data uh, into, a, into a neat spreadsheet, we were able to look at some averages. So we, 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 we talked about that dividing line between third av or right around Third Avenue, and we looked at the average width for each one of those profiles from Third Avenue north. Okay, so this line basically graphically shows what that average would be. I believe that average width, the distance between 12 and 4, is about 57 feet in that section. We also looked at what that same average would be from 3rd Avenue going <coughs> south to the town boundary. Um, and we calculated that average, which again is represented by this blue line. I think it's about 84, uh, 84 feet. Um, so now we're looking at the difference between what, what, and you all may disagree, what we're suggesting would be, you know, a, 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 uh, an acceptable average width of the beach from 3rd Avenue south throughout the town as opposed, an un, as, as opposed to an unacceptable beach width north of 3rd Avenue up on the northern end. And we're looking at that difference between 84 and 57. We also went through that same exercise, basically looking at what would the average be if we looked at just the area that provide that where beach beach fill was placed back in 2017. Again, this is the 20 the May 2019 conditions, but this is the area that sand was placed in May 2017, and we also we calculated that average would came, which came out to about 103 feet between those two widths. All right, so we put that into a table. That table is in that addendum that you all are looking at. And we, um, we, we looked at, all right, well, th that gives us a width, but what would the equivalent volume necessary to widen the beach that much be? And for the difference between the, the, the section of town from 3rd Street South and the section of town from 3rd Street North, it works out right to around uh, 30 cubic yards a linear foot is what would need to be placed up there as a design volume to be able to to widen that beach to the same degree of where where the rest of the average beach is throughout southern shores uh, in today's condition. We also looked at that other threshold that that average throughout the area that 103 foot width obviously that that area had been nourished uh, a year and a half ago or two years ago um, the, the volume to get to that, to, to get to that width was, I, I would say, cost prohibitive. We could certainly provide you all a number for that, but it is higher than the other options that we've, that we've talked to council about at this point in time. So we can discuss that, we can calculate that, but at this point in time, um, you know, we've put that one aside and we've talked about trying to, trying to get that northern section of town up to where the rest of the town is on average. We also provided a couple of graphics. Um, this, these weren't in the addendum. We can certainly make them a part of the final addendum once they're submitted. Uh, I provided them to, um, to Wes, I, I think maybe Friday or maybe it was earlier. Uh, it was probably the end of last week. Um, but these, they're, they're big 11 by 17 maps. And basically what we tried to show here is in that, in that upper pane, we're looking in that northern area of town where, you know, the, where, the, where the beach is narrow. This would be the Hillcrest access, 8th, 7th, 6th, 5th is behind the legend over here. But you're looking at the same area of town in the northern panel and the southern panel. The northern panel is looking at a 2008 uh, image. Let me make sure I got my dates correct here. The northern, yeah, the northern uh, is looking at um, a 2008 image and the southern is looking at a 2018 image and the lines that you see on there the the, the solid lines you know, let's look in the northern panel the solid black line is that 12 foot contour that we just spent a whole lot of time talking about and the and the dotted black line or darker line is the the plus four foot contour and that's based on data from 2009 lidar data from 2009 the red lines are those same two contours, but now we're looking at 2018 data. All right. So when I look at this, when I, when I look at this sort of qualitatively and say, all right, well, what's going on here? I look in this section up around Hillcrest and I say, all right, well, in that 10 year period, the four foot contour hasn't really changed a whole lot. It's fairly consistent. 
in this section. But what has happened is that that 12 foot contour has actually moved further out seaward. So you've got more dune in that section, but the beach has basically steepened up in that, in that, during that period of time. So the dune actually looks like it probably has more volume in that section, but that dry sand beach, as we're measuring it, is thinner uh, in, that, in that area. Um, the, the opposite is true in this section here. It looks like you know, there is still a little bit of growth of the dune, you know, that red line moving seaward from the black line. But here, that red line, that four foot contour has actually moved <coughs> landward. So you're, you're squeezing your usable beach even more in this section uh, between 5th Street and, and 6th Street. Um, so that, that usable beach is getting smaller. So um, the image is so, sort of telling us you know, how that came to be, where that section is getting narrower. Um, it certainly suggests the fact that that area has gotten narrower. This image here, now we're moving further south into the main fill area where we're saying, you know, the, the, the widths are, at, at present, those widths are much wider. Um, it's, a, it's, you know, as far as the dry sand beach, it's in better shape. As far as the dune, um, there's less volume in the system. But as far as that usable dry sand beach, um, this is that area down around uh, uh, Porpoise and, and Trout uh, Lane. Um, but again, here we can see that that plus four foot contour has actually moved uh, seaward a little bit, widening the beach, whereas the dune line between 2008 and 2019 seems to be um, you know, somewhat static. The, 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 this, this pattern here is that same pattern I was talking about earlier when you get that sort of hummocky pattern in the sand on the beaches out there, different times of year. And then this third panel that I want to show, uh, again, you're looking at 2008 imagery in the, in the top, 2018 imagery in the bottom. But we went back a little bit further and found a LIDAR data set from 2001. So the northern panel, you're looking at the difference between the, the, the 2001 data in purple and the 2009 data in black. And the southern panel, you're looking at the difference between the 2001 data and the 2018 data, okay? All right, so that's, that's how we've gone through that analysis of trying to make the subjective a little bit more objective and understanding wh what we're talking about when we talk about usable beach widths. Um, so let's talk a little bit about these additional options. Uh, I showed in this slide earlier, these were the original options that were provided. Um, the volumes were modified in that pro in that in that um, in the uh, the plan that we provided back in September of 2019. Um, so here in these options, you've got what we call the main placement area where the fill density is is higher. Uh, these aren't exactly to scale, but it's more graphically to show that more sand would be placed in this section, the main fill placement section, than in the transition section. All right, so option one and option three would be set up with that sort of configuration. This is getting into what we're calling option four that's presented in that addendum. All right, so now we have a uniform beach width or a uniform beach density uh, with a design fill of 30 cubic yards a linear foot. Uh, I'll show you a, a breakdown of all the volume that would be placed on that beach. Uh, the total volume density is gonna be higher than 30. But to, to achieve the usable beach criteria, we would place 30 cubic yards a linear foot of design fill along this entire section of beach. The northern portion, the main placement area, and the transition area. We also provided numbers for what we call the, the, the hybrid option or option five, which is basically still trying to achieve that storm damage reduction uh, in that main placement area, but also achieving that usable beach width all the way throughout the town as well. So basically making sure that we've achieved all of the goals that are set um, as part of that beach management plan. So here graphically we're just showing a, a wider density in this central area where again going back to that volume envelope <laughs> principle, um, you know, we need more volume in that, that area to achieve the stated desire or the, the stated goal of storm damage reduction. All right, so just talking about volumes of sand right here, uh, I had just talked about placing 30 cubic yards a linear foot along the entire length of beach. That's where this number here comes from, this design volume number comes from, all right? 
There's also something that we've talked about in our previous reports, talking about diffusion losses. Um, this is a principle whereby when you place a bulge of sand on a long, flat shoreline, uh, nature has a tendency of wanting to, f wanting, wanting to thin that out, spread that material out. So a lot of times you see losses off of the ends of these projects. That's why we put things in like a taper to try to minimize some of that. But that volume in that category is simply what we've computed based on some other analysis of how much volume you would want to want to provide there for to, to deal with that diffusion principle. Um, this next column, we talk about advanced fill volume. We've talked about this a lot in the past where you've got a design, a, a, a design that you're trying to achieve and you're going to put the sand out there to achieve that design, but you don't want that design there just on day one. You want that design there in year five when it's time to come back and put additional sand on the beach. So we're going to, we're going to put that design volume and then we're going to put additional sacrificial sand on top of that design volume, which is the amount of sand we would expect to erode away over the course of whatever the renourishment interval is, is here. In, in this case, it would be five years. Um, the astute observer would say option four and option five are longer projects, so why have you not increased the amount of sacrificial sand you think you're going to lose over the course of um, of that five-year period. Um, <clears throat> the reason we've kept this number the same is that in order to come up with this number, 225, we came up with that, with that number when we were only considering a project south of 3rd Street. So we looked at the erosion rates between 3rd Street and the southern end of town, and that erosion rate was something in the, in the neighborhood of three cubic yards per linear foot per year. So we said, all right, well, to figure out how much sacrificial sand we need, we're going to take three cubic yards per foot per year, multiply it by five years, and spread that out over that distance of beach. That number is 225,000 cubic yards. When we went in and looked at what would, that, what would that equivalent rate be, if we looked at the entire town, the, the loss, the rate loss, is actually lower than three cubic yards a linear foot. It's actually only one cubic yard a linear foot when we factor in what's going on throughout the entire town. So instead of decreasing that number, saying, all right, well, now we only need 197,000 cubic yards in that column, and somebody's saying, how can you build a bigger project and need less advanced fill? Conservatively, we've simply kept that number constant for all of these options. Right? Um, the taper volume is simply a, a factor of how wide the density of the fill is uh, at, the, at the northern terminus of the project. So the wider that density is, the, the, the more volume it takes to build that taper. And then this sort of sums up, all right, how, how much total volume would we be talking about? This total volume is the number we use to uh, estimate the costs for the project. Getting to costs. Um, so the additional options, this is the summary table number three. Uh, one of the things I'll point out is as we went through option one and we, we took another look at some of these construction soft costs and construction environmental monitoring costs, we found a, a, a discrepancy in the way that we originally calculated the, the, uh, the cost estimate for option one. So if you look at those older reports, this total cost for option one is, is a little over 14 million. Uh, the, the, updated vo the updated estimate is now just a little under 14 million. It's a fairly insignificant amount, but it's still right around that 14 million, million dollar uh, range. Uh, again, that option three, this comes from the previous report. This, this, this number is higher simply because the storm that we use to develop that plan is assuming 30 years from now's sea level rise, sea levels as opposed to today's sea levels. Um, and then Option four is the option I just talked about, spreading 30 cubic yards of linear feet, trying to widen that beach uh, based on that, that, that beach width analysis that we conducted. So that, that cost is uh, about seven, $750,000 more than the original option one, but still in that 14 to $15 million range. And then option five is basically the, the best of both worlds. Option five is the same fill that we talked about to try to achieve that storm damage reduction for option one and spreading an additional 
30 cubic yards a linear foot in the northern section of town. Um, and that option comes out to just over 16 million, 16.2 million is the estimate there. All right. Um, I'm going to stop there, take a breath, let you all ask some questions. I've got some additional graphics that we may or may not use depending on questions. Um, tried to come prepared for as much as I could. Questions? Yes, sir. Why do you project out 30 years sea level rise when beach renourishment, from my understanding, would be done every five years? That's correct. Um, we, we looked at that option um, once we started, I guess it was somewhat academic when we first did that. Um, when, we, when we started looking at um, redoing that S beach analysis and, and saying, all right, well, you know, we don't want to use the beach or the storm conditions in 2003 because that, that was 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Um, we want to we wanna increase that sea level up to a level as where it is today. So we're talking apples and apples. And then one of the engineers said, well, what if we jack that up 30 years from now and see what sea level rise would look like in 30 years from now and run the same analysis? That's basically where we came up with that option three. Um, in all of these public forums, someone, someone will always ask the question, have you, um, you know, have you considered sea level rise? This is something we wanted to be able to say, you know, we, we have considered sea level rise, but your question is very pointed in that every five years, this is an adaptive management uh, process. Every five years, you have a chance to look at what that, what that beach fill did over the last five years and adjust how much volume you need out there. And that would be the time where you would start incrementally increasing the amount of sand to deal with any sort of measured sea level rise that you observe over time. Not necessarily planning you know, 30 years in advance for what may or may not occur. Um, so I think your question is, is pointed, but I, I, I suppose that that was somewhat of an academic exercise to go through to come up with that option three that gives a higher level of protection. Looking 30 years out, that's what you're call and place an additional sand. That's what you're calling it the advanced fill, right? No, the advanced fill is simply to deal with what we believe will be lost over the course of the next five years. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yes, so why can't we just look at the sand that would be lost over the next five years and add that volume? That is the volume that we use. When I show those 225 numbers, that that is that's how that number was computed. Um, the only the only place where that, um, that 30 years comes into play for option three is when, if you look at that, that older report, um, when you, we have a number that's assigned to that, um, that volume envelope, that yellow shape under the curve. If you're dealing with a storm that would hit 30 years from now, the amount of volume you need in that yellow area is more than you would need today. That's the only place where that comes into play. It doesn't, it doesn't come into play as we factor in what the advanced fill volume should be for the next five years. And you'll see that that's 48 and we're targeting 35 or 36. Mm -hmm. So every five years we can incrementally be working towards 48 okay. by the time we reach 30. So you're years, not proposing it? putting more sand on the beach today based on what the conditions may be 30 years from now? I would say option three suggests that, but there hasn't, since, since it was originally proposed and thrown out there, I don't think uh, council has, you know, grasped one to option three and talked about potentially doing that. I think there's even been some commentary along the lines of what you're suggesting that um, wouldn't it be more prudent to move forward in a fashion where we're dealing with five-year increments as opposed to, you know, what sea level may look like 30 years from now and a, and a storm that we're trying to protect from today that may, you know, that, 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 that's, deal, that's using, that's, that, you know, that, that the parameters have been inflated to deal with what sea level may look like 30 years from now. Okay. Um, it's not to say that that storm couldn't happen. Um, you could get elevated water levels in excess of what water levels would be 30 years from now. It's just a simple matter of academics of how we went through that analysis and saying, well, what if we, what if we ramped up the threshold even more? How much incrementally more sand will we need to provide? And you could also get that exit, uh, that higher water level in two years. Correct. Um. We, we, I mean, there's lots of sea, there's lots of sea level uh, projection curves. We use the ones that were adopted by the the Coastal Resources Commission, the North Carolina Coastal Resources Commission. Um, you know, it, it, 
takes into consideration you know, past measurements at the duck field research facility. It, pr it takes into pr projections some estimates of what the impact of um, you know, increased you know, carbon in the atmosphere and, the, and that sort of thing. So. Can, <clears throat> what am I missing? What, I'm, what am I missing on option four? Is, what are the downsides to looking at option four as a, as a viable alternative? Yeah, we've thought a lot about what the downsides are um, to looking at option four. And I, I don't think that we would suggest that there is a downside. I mean, we've come up with this analysis that said uh, if you want, if the goal is to provide sufficient um, storm damage reduction for a Hurricane Isabel level storm, this is specifically the number, the density, the volume that needs to be placed out there to achieve that. That in and of itself is, is somewhat of a subjective decision. That storm could hit uh, you know, this coming year. A storm greater than that could hit next year. A storm of that magnitude may not hit for 20 years from now. Um, so it is somewhat of a subjective decision. One of, the, one of the, the pieces of information that we wrote in that addendum is that there is a way to quantify the storm damage reduction um, uh, protection that you would get from option four as we as we are you know if you decide to you know, hire a different consultant as they go through a, a more rigorous design process to get to uh, obtaining permits and, and developing plans and specifications uh, a, a more thorough analysis will be done to understand all right well what's the optimal configuration of how we want to place that fill out there and and all of the these models and, and metrics that we've used metrics that we've used to, to do this analysis um, could be used to try to quantify, all right, well, you know, they said we needed 36 cubic yards a linear foot to achieve that Isabel protection. Now we're talking about 30 cubic yards a linear foot. You know, what, what, what does that mean in terms of trying to wrap your head around it? You know, we could go through that analysis and, and provide, you know, a little bit more qualitative, quantitative assessment of that. Um, can but we, I, excuse me, can we, can we achieve that usable beach of, say, 85 feet or whatever with, with option four? Is that not Yes, possible? that's correct. I, so it would, it would obviously, it would achieve the usable beach as like a, as a minimum threshold <clears throat> in, the, in the northern section of town. And then in that central section of town, uh, you know, inherently every cubic yards of sand you put out there is providing you some level of storm damage reduction. So you're getting 30 cubic yards more of storm damage reduction that you wouldn't have in existing conditions. And that was what I was saying, you know, I can say that now. We could try to quantify that a little <coughs> bit more and, 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 and let you know, you know, what does that mean? How do you wrap your head around what that 30 provides as opposed to 36? But, um, you know, certainly it would, it would widen the beach in the northern section and it would provide additional storm damage reduction in that main fill placement area that we've identified as the most vulnerable in terms of storm damage. So to, Thank you. to follow up on that, on option four, you haven't run any SBH analyses for that reduced field That's volume. correct. And that's the type of thing that we could go back with and say, all right, well, now we're dealing How with How long would that take? Uh, it, it wouldn't take very long. Even um, if you picked a handful of profiles of right. vulnerable during the first analysis? Right. Because, I mean, for me, I think that would be indicative of which direction between those two options yeah. that I would be willing to entertain. Yeah, I agree with that. Repeat your question for me. I, I would, was wondering if they'd run S beach analysis with a storm damage analysis. So when they first ran it, they had determined 36 cubic yards for linear foot or whatever. Um, now we're talking about potentially 30 with option four, so reducing the dunes for technical. So I think when you first showed us the analysis um, of the dune as is, there was breaching, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't catastrophic necessarily. So 30 may be a viable alternative. I, I just was curious. If Correct. You, if and it, it, I it. mean, it, what it, what it's probably going to tell us is, all right, well, under the, under, under existing conditions and, and when you say breaching, just, you know, for the yeah, general public, like, terms. yeah, we don't, we're not talking about an inlet would form through yeah. the beach. We're basically talking about <laughs> some of these profiles. If you, if you simulate the, the storm, that Isabel storm, um, the crest of the dune where it is today would not be impacted. You would lose some sand off the front of the dune. It would slough off a little bit, but the, but you could go back to the same elevation at the crest of that dune, the high point of that dune, and it would not change. Some of those 
uh, if that storm, that same storm impacted, you would lose sand off of the top of that dune. And so those are the profiles that we said, all right, in these areas where, where we're seeing loss of the top of the dune, those are the areas that, you know, we are more vulnerable, relatively speaking, than the rest of the town. So, you know, we could certainly quantify, all right, well, it, before in this section we had, you know, 90% of the profiles, the crest was impacted, whereas with 30, uh, or with 36, zero were impacted. With 30, you know, 10% are impacted, right? Or 8%, something like that. It, if you went with a 30 mile, this is probably down the line design, uh, you'd mentioned you'd, you'd employed a new technique of the starter dunes in Kitty Hawk. Correct. With something, I mean, since we would be increasing the sand volume beyond their usable beach, we'd, we'd get more than 84 in that area, would be potentially some of the volume could contribute to a starter dune or something. I mean, is that. Is that something you all looked at? Uh, it, it isn't. I mean, when you talk about it, you know, qual um, qualitatively, uh, this is a, this is an example of what Matt's talking about. In in Kitty Hawk, um, well, in Kill Double Hills and in Duck, we were designing a project similar to the way that we developed that design in that main fill placement area, saying that the existing volume is insufficient to provide a certain level of storm damage reduction. So we need more sand. Well. Part of that sand went into building a bigger, higher dune. Part of that sand went into build, building a wider beach. In Kitty Hawk, the, the concern was, one of the issues was there were so many houses farther out on the beach that we couldn't build a robust dune out in front of these houses and build a, 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 a large dry sand beach in front of it, simply from financial, uh, financial limitations. So what we did was we built a, a, just a flat berm, a flat sand beach, uh, with a small, modest, you know, condensed dune that we call it a starter dune. And then they, pro they, they put sand fencing on that dune, which inherently with all this dry sand blowing around in the wintertime like it is today, catches a lot of sand. So these, the, this sand fence here, when it was set, there was four feet of sand, uh, you know, four feet of posts sticking out of the top of, um, you know, the, the, the level ground where these things were placed. You know, now in some of those, I, I, I'd venture to guess you're, you know, two feet, 18 inches. So it's catching sand. It's, it's putting more sand into the dune. Th this is a similar picture here uh, further down the beach where you can't even see the top yeah. of the, the sand fence. It's been completely buried. So they've got four feet of growth on top of that. Um, this is a photo down in Kill Double Hills at the Sea Ranch. This is prior to the beach project going in, but this is what it looks like now. Um, and again, you know, vegetating that dune area, putting up that sand fence, it does capture a lot more sand and provides, uh, provides more sand. I, I will say that that S beach analysis isn't premised just on how much sand is in the dune. Um, not only is it important you want to have a, a robust dune in front of your house to provide storm damage reduction, but you want a sufficient quantity of sand offshore that's going to break that wave energy up before it, it rolls all the way up and hits the dune and starts, you know, scarping away the dune. So the sand distributed along the whole profile is, you know, is what you want. But right before a storm hits, you know, you definitely would like to have as much sand in that dune as possible. So if we did go into a, if we did go into an option four, we would likely build a dry sand beach in the transition area and in the northern section. But we would probably play around a little bit with, um, you know, do we just do a starter dune? Do we put a little bit more of a dune in that section um, and then spread the rest to create that dry sand beach in front of it? But that's some of the more of the, you know, robust design analysis that will that'll, that'll, that'll go into the project. You're talking there about on the southern end of the beach? Yes. On the southern Pelican end. Pelican Watch area. Y yes. On the, the southern end, the northern area. Right. Right. Thank you. I've heard it stated before that, generally speaking, the dunes in Southern Shores are pretty healthy dunes, whereas in Kitty Hawk, for example, at one point there were no dunes hardly, and that was, that's reflected in our different goals. Their goal was to stop the ocean overwash on the NC-12. Yeah, Would well, you agree that our dunes are generally pretty healthy? Uh, that's what the that's what the S beach analysis showed. I mean, the S beach analysis shows that you know up in the northern section, north of Third Avenue, the dunes you know are are, are fairly healthy. South of that, um, you know, they're fairly healthy. And even in that main main fill section, um, 
the amount of volume that we're talking to achieve the, the, the design, um, you know, the design criteria is far less than some of the design volumes that we came up with for Kill Devil Hills and for Duck. Their fill density at Duck in particular was, I mean, well over twice the amount of fill that we're talking about placing in the town of Southern Shores. And that's a testament of the fact that, um, you know, when, when the town of Duck got into the game, there were houses teetering on the brink of falling into the ocean. It was, you know, it was absolutely critical at that point in time, similar in parts of Kill Double Hills and Kitty Hawk. Do they still have the sandbags? Uh, I, I believe there probably are some. Um, I showed this picture. This picture, I think, is from, what, 2015, 16. It, it, was, it wasn't, like, right before they started placing sand there. Um, but I, I, I don't think we had seen any, you know, we hadn't seen any sandbags when they went in to, to place material there. I wouldn't be surprised if there's still sandbags there. But that picture there is 2015? I believe okay, that picture is 2015. Like those bags are there anymore. Yeah. So, can, but, but anyway, that has nothing to do with sure. some insurers. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for uh, bringing us some of the historic uh, imagery going back to 2001, I think, is the, the oldest contours, contour line yeah, that you're providing. the contour is 2001. The image is 2008, 2018. Right. Were you able to find any, any uh, either contours or imagery that predates 2001 like that goes back into the 90s or 80s or 70s there is some imagery in those in those in, in those graphics that we created we were trying to line up as close as possible so the the imagery date in this one in particular the imagery date and the contour date are not the exact same time they're you know within 12 months or something like that, less than 12 months, but they're not, one might be a, a winter picture and a, you know, and a, and a summer, you know, LIDAR survey. So they're not exactly the same. We were trying to get as close as possible when we, when we did this. There are a lot of LIDAR data sets to pick from. There's a lot of aerial imagery to pick from. Uh, and to create these graphics, we were trying to get as close as possible to show an imagery date and a LIDAR date that were, that were similar. No, I, I, I understand that. I think you did a great job. I'm just trying to um, ask you if there is imagery readily available <laughs> that would give us an idea of where the Southern Shores Beach was in the 70s, 80s, and 90s as opposed to in the 2000s. Is there any anything we could just fairly easily at low cost reach out and... Well, at, I mean, if it, yeah, Google Earth would give you uh, probably back to like the mid '90s. Um, so just you know, just going into Google Earth, and and it's not going to give you know, you wouldn't have the contours in front of you, but you'd be able to look at at imagery dates in Google Earth. Uh, we had gone through and looked at some of that over the last couple of weeks, um, try to pull some of that out. The Corps of Engineers may um, the gentleman mentioned the data that the, that the FRF has they would be a good source to try to go back beyond the 90s and see if there is historical data mm -hmm. I know in the southern part of the state um, you know some of the projects that are down there are a little older and you can go back and, and get you know aerial imagery from you know the 50s the 40s um, the state the state of North Carolina also while I'm kind of thinking out loud the state of North Carolina when they come up with their erosion setback lines all of those erosion setback lines, or at least until very recently, were, ba were, 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 were determined by digitizing old photos and digitizing that wet dry line, which is somewhat of a subjective line, and comparing how that line has changed over time. So the state of North Carolina, uh, specifically, I can give you the name of a guy at the Division of Coastal Management, would also have some of those historic aerial photos that could be brought into a, you know, a GIS to be able to compare apples to apples. Some of those erosion lines have been challenged in court, however, um, because of their accuracy or lack thereof and the huge ramifications those have on the uh, setbacks and everything. Yeah, I, I simply brought it up as a you know, potential other source of, of imagery. I mean, the imagery would be good. Uh, certainly, I think they would, you know, they would tell you as well that they're limited by the data that they have to try to come up with you know, some sort of a, you know, 
objective metric throughout the state to come up with those lines. Uh, other questions? I have an academic one. The, the scalloping that shows up between 09 and 18 around Yellowfin and some of that area. Yep. Um, it's, I mean, the LIDAR data is pretty accurate, so it wouldn't be data collection issues. Is it, it really the contour in that section starts shifting that way? Yeah. I mean, yeah do you I have think any comment on why? No, I mean, it's, it's a seasonal thing. I mean, you, you see it, you know, I mean, you can see it in the, in the summertime as well, but a lot of times in the, in the wintertime, uh, it's just a, a pattern of the certain wave setup, and it's sort of like this, uh, uh, you know, this, this self-feeding cycle of once you've got a little bit of a pertur perturbation, um, you know, every time that wave runs up, it's doing something a little bit different in the low area than it is the high area, and it starts to kind of feed, creating that pattern. Uh, out there and until you know some sort of a you know a storm event comes in that sort of submerges the whole thing and, and reshuffles <coughs> the deck um, you know th those things will persist out there for yeah. a while but uh, it's I mean it's more seasonal uh, than it is you know long, a long-term well, trend or an issue I just noticed the distinction between your two contour lines or I mean they were similar seasons right okay but I mean, from from one year to another, yeah, you yeah. may it, you may get that effect in the winter one year. You may not get that Stage effect five. in another year. You got the questions, Council for Ken. All right, tell him to stick around and if you would, in the public forum, happy to try to answer. Yes, questions. Would okay. like for you to do that. Thank sure. you, Ken. Happy to do. It. This time I invite um, DEC associates Doug and Andrew Carter to come make their presentation to us as far as how we might be able to pay for this. <laughs> Good morning. Uh -huh. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good to have you here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, lady and gentlemen of the city council, um, we are happy to be here. Um, we're going to uh, go fairly quickly to the bottom line because I suppose that's something we might all want to talk about. I do want to give you uh, just a little bit of background to start with, though, however, especially since there's some new folks on the city council. Um, we came to you about a year ago, um, about a year ago, to make a presentation on how you do the financing part of beach nourishment, what are the sources that are available by law in North Carolina, what have others done, especially in this area. And as part of that, we said to you, which we'll say again today, all of the beach towns that are inside Dare County are in a very unique and special place because the county has, we are advisor to the county as well, for those of you who may or may not know that. The county has made uh, its partnership with the towns and beach nourishment a top priority. And as you know, it has levied special taxes, has them in a special fund, has set aside a significant amount of money to partnership with the towns, and to this point has partnership with a number, the first being Nags Head, as you know. And in fact, the Nags Head um, uh, freshening up of the beach has already happened since it happened a number of years ago. And so you have a very special arrangement. And as part of doing that, the county decided, this was back in oh, six years ago, seven years six or seven years ago that they had to establish some sort of standard as to how they dealt with the towns individually. And so Andrew's gonna talk a bit more in a minute about what were the standards because each one of the projects that are down the beach didn't cost the same per capita or as a percentage of the assessed value of the town or any other measurement you might take. Some, obviously the Kitty Hawk was rather expensive and had its own unique needs, some of which were addressed earlier in terms of health and safety and uh, roadways and where water came and all of those things. So the point is, there has been a standard that's been established by the county and we're gonna talk through what it might cost for you today using that same set of standards that the county has used. We have not at this point, and I will say this to you, we have not at this point, um, updated the models since the, the county, uh, the Bobby probably and Dave last discussed with you their models and where they are. That is an in progress kind of thing. And so what we're gonna bring you today are these alternatives 
what the costs are, how they would work inside the financial model the county has set up to be fair to everyone to show you what it would take to pay for these. Um, I think it's really important to talk about how you get the money really pretty quickly, somewhat as a review, but also to give you some comparatives. Uh, when we got involved with this, we had been the county's financial advisor since the formation of our firm 15 years ago. I, I gave the last council some of mine and Andrew's background. I'm going to do it really, really quickly, too. I grew up in the local government commission, became the finance director of the city of Charlotte, and then a number of years ago decided that I was going to go into the private business, into the business sector and started doing public finance on the private side. And then 15 years ago, I established my own independent financial advisory firm and have done that for 15 years. We have, as part of our practice, a sub-practice, which is Beach Nourishment, and that all happened because I got a call one day from Bobby saying, how are we going to finance this? We have some money. We want to help the towns but we don't borrow like the towns borrow. The towns borrow in a different way. We can't figure out how to make this work. And we went, sort of went into what I would call a little study session in one of their big old rooms. And out of that came uh, the method that all of the towns have currently used. So I want to just go through really quickly what are the methods and talk to you about some comparatives. Obviously, if you were wealthy, you could just pay for it. It was, it was all in the bank, saved up. If you had 16 or 18, 17 million dollars, you'd just pay good. Just draw it out and pay for it. Fortunately, unfortunately, you aren't there. Uh, there are borrowed methods. There, under the state law, there are general obligation methods. And there have been some general obligation bonds voted on in certain counties for beach nourishment. Not here, as I understand it, but it's more some of the southern counties. Obviously, it's a longer, more laborious process. It takes time to get it done. Um, but it has been used. Um, there is installment purchase financing. But if you do an installment purchase financing, you have to have an asset that you pledge. Well, sand is not an asset. And so you would have to pledge all of the buildings the town owned or some other assets. That generally, because of the size and the cost of the projects, has not been something that worked. And so herein lay the dilemma, what, what else is next? <coughs> and so there are two other means that can be used. One is special assessment bonds. That's very difficult and is, really requires special legislation to do it well. Um, one of our clients in the more southern part of the state, the town of Oak Island, has special legislation to do special assessment bonds. And we've looked at it with them multiple times but just hasn't been used. They're, they're, they're tough. They're, they're very hard to do. And then finally, what came up, at least what we have said is the preferred method, is the use of special obligation bonds. And what that essentially does is, is it says, you do not have to have a voter referendum, but you do have to establish municipal service districts. Now, technically, you don't have to levy tax in that MSD. You have to create them. Because without an MSD, under our state law, you cannot issue special obligation bonds. And special obligation bonds, what they are, is the pledge of a revenue that comes to you that you do not set the rate for. You can't pledge your, sales, your property tax because you set it. The sales tax that comes to you that's established by someone else, you can pledge sales tax as a repayment source under a special obligation bonds. You can pledge beer and wine taxes. I mean, any tax levied by someone else, any fee you levy you can do, but any tax levied by someone else, you can pledge. And so basically, and, and also in partnership with the county, if they supply, supply any support, and you'll see this in some of the numbers that are coming quickly, any numbers to help pay, pay annual debt service, that interlocal agreement revenue can be pledged under a special obligation bond and have by the other towns that have annual money coming from the county to assist with debt service. And so basically what it does is it says you can get a bank to loan you money for five years if you show enough of these revenues of taxes that you do not levy or, or, or fees, uh, any money off of an interlocal that will provide the debt service plus a little coverage to the bank so that they know that there's excess money. And so that made for a very 
easy way. Now, to give you some comfort, um, you may levy property taxes to pay the debt service, right? You just can't pledge it under the special obligation bonds. And so that revenue you pledged under a special obligation bond is now in your general fund. Okay, that's how you balance the general fund budget. You can continue to appropriate that money and balance your general fund budget out of those revenues. It's just if you don't pay the debt service, the bank comes and gets those revenues. So it's a really interesting method. It took some time to think through how it works. So that's why we believed it's somewhat the preferred method. It's easy for you to control, to make it work, to find the sources. Of, where there are more than one bank who does this and who are very interested in doing this. Uh, it can be done fairly rapidly. And I would just say to you, when you compare GO bonds, which are typically known as the cheapest form of borrowing, if you compare that to special obligation bonds, because these are generally five-year borrowings, you borrow for five years, there's very little difference in the interest cost between those two methods. It's because the terms are so short. And as we all know, the way we work with interest rates, now the lowest interest rates are in the shortest years, not the longest years. And so it has been something of a preferred method because it was developed in this county, created in Dare County, has now been used in others as a method to get this done. So those are the methods. We can talk more about uh, the others if you want to in a minute, which might be better or worse. We've just found the special obligations to work. Now what we're going to do is, um, in fact, I've talked a little bit about the special yeah. elements of those. Andrew will get into the moment. Doug stole a little bit of my thunder on my slide here. But uh, just to reiterate, yes, special obligation bonds tend to be the preferred method. Under the state statute, if you go and look, Beach Nourishment is listed, I believe, as, as A, as the purposes for, for special obligation bonds. So they, they work very well in trying to finance something that doesn't have a real tangible asset like sand. Um, so the unique, unique assets, uh, of course, as Doug said, you can only pledge the revenues, not levied. Uh, we've been looking at sales tax and occupancy tax is what would be pledged. As Doug said, you would continue to put those in your budget and spend those as you would. Um, those would only be come after if you don't pay your bills. So it's just like your home. You continue to live in your home as long as you're paying the mortgage. If you stop paying the mortgage, you're going to come after the home. So um, it's a way of creating a collateral pool out of, out of something like sand that doesn't have a really <coughs> tangible asset to it. Um, uh, currently, and we'll see this in a second, the level of revenues that you may generate uh, may not be sufficient to meet the capital standards. And as Doug talked about, the use of a, a, a town and county in a local agreement may be, have to be used. A number of towns have done that where annually their county has entered into an agreement to provide additional funds for debt service. Um, the revenues for the actual debt repayment are, are probably revenues you're going to have to raise as part of this process. Um, currently available sources could be townwide, could be uh, taxes within a municipal service district you may set up. It could be a combination of sources. It could be budget savings. It could come from any number of different sources in order to come up with what, uh, under the plan, as Doug talked about, uh, the, the, your skin in the game. Uh, and then the county and our local funds somewhat work on both sides of the equation. You can, you, you can count them on the collateral side and you can use them for the actual repayment of that debt. So they, they kind of work on both sides of that equation for special obligation bonds. Um, so uh, as we discussed before, this unique uh, partnership that the county has with its towns, we do not see this all over the state. This is a very unique uh, place where Dale County leverages the two cents of its occupancy tax is dedicated for this purpose, and it's dedicated by the, the, the legislation of which they have to levy these two cents. So they can only use it for these purposes, and the county is, is really intending to try to leverage this money as best they can to the towns, uh, because they not only have to fund the town projects, but also the unincorporated areas where there might be a need. Uh, I believe Rodan comes to, comes to mind, and this, that other parts of the county um, that they have to do. So they have to fit those projects underneath there as well. Um, as we discussed, the uniqueness of this uh, relationship is that the county intends in the beginning, when you're starting to put the project together and starting to put the numbers together, to fund at least 50% of the project. That's, that's where we want as a starting point. 
they want to fund at least 50% of the project. So you'll see the numbers that we're getting ready to show. That's why you'll, we will see a 50-50 split in the beginning. Um, the, the other prong of the relationship is that uh, all the towns who have entered into these projects and gotten help from the county have raised an equivalent of what was 7.82 cents of their property tax equivalent at the time. So this is technically what the county has come up with as your skin in the game. All the towns who have done these beach management projects have come up with an equivalent of 7.82 cents. Now they've all sliced and diced that differently depending on the way that they would like. Some have multiple municipal service districts, some got taxed town-wide, some did a hybrid of those two uh, uh, methods. So 7.82 cents right now based on your penny equivalent that equates to right at $1,074,000. That is what your skin in this game would be in partnership with the county. Um, and this would have to start being raised in the 21-22 fiscal year. So not this June, but next June when you're swinging the gavel on the next year's budget, it would include whatever slicing and dicing of revenue raising to get to the million seventy four number we're looking at right now. So, that's kind of the number we're delivering today. That's your skin in the game um, to, to work out the plans you're getting ready to see here. So we're gonna go through each option that was delivered by, uh, by Aptim today. Um, option one, three, four, and five, and you'll see how uh, the numbers flow in and out to get this all done. So in option one, we'll see the project cost was about 13.9 million. We're adding a little bit of cushion. That's probably a very conservative uh, number to uh, get to a total borrowing amount of just over $14 million. You'll see in the sources, if we split that up 50-50, the county would be uh, coming with right over $7 million, and then the town would borrow uh, just over $7 million as well. If, they bought, if the town borrows the $7 million as estimated in these numbers, you'll see in the debt service estimate in the bottom left-hand corner box, that's our estimate of principal and interest payments for the five years. Uh, I believe it's a 3% interest is what we have in here. We ho hope that that's a conservative number and the real number would be lower. Um, and then, so you'll see your total debt service starts at about uh, 1 million six. And due to the nature of financings in North Carolina with a level principal payment, you have a falling debt service payment each year. And then you'll see the repayment revenues. The approximately 1074000 that would be coming from the town. The county would have to enter into an interlocal agreement. This is what we were talking about, uh, the interlocal agreement for those particular figures for the next five years to help support you to be able to make the actual debt service uh, payments. Um, so to make it simple from my point of view when I was reviewing this for Andrew, even though you're splitting 50-50 the cost of the capital, when you get down to the debt service, your skin in the game, as Andrew's called, called the million of 74, is not enough to pay your debt service. Now the county is also paying their debt service on their seven million, and so essentially you would have to enter into a negotiation with the county to enter an agreement to provide the county contributed money so that the total debt service between your million of 73 to 928, together with their money, would pay the annual debt service. So this would be part of the credit package you put together to go out with an RFP to banks and saying, here's the plan of finance. And, and I think out of this whole discussion when we started, uh, really um, with Nags Head was the first deal, and then all the others came to the forefront, and the 7.82 cents became the determination. I mean, bottom line is, if, if the county had said, basically, we'll go half of what you can pay in debt service, we'll just double it, we wouldn't have gotten nearly $14 million. So the county said, let's, let's look at us funding half and half, and then if you don't have half of your debt service, we'll talk to you about that. So ultimately, what you will do once we go through all the options, and then the town council has made a decision on the option that it feels is best, you'll go to the county and say, here's why we really want to do this project, why we think it's best for the community, not just ours, but the plethora of beach communities that exist along this island, 
and here's what we need your help in. And so this, this will be somewhat reiterated as we go through this next option. <coughs> You know, option two had an, an increased size of, of about 16.6 on project size. We had cost of issuance, we get to around 16.7. Um, you'll see here the county would bring $8.3 million in their borrowing uh, up front, and you would borrow, the town would borrow a higher amount. It would now go to $8.3 million. But you'll notice that if we look at the repayment revenues, the town contributed amount has stayed the same. Your 7.82 cents you're contributing to the project stays the same, and you see that it's ultimately the county contributed column that plugs the hole you know, um, between those two. So um, just as Doug said, uh, part of the next step will be um, <coughs> in negotiation with the county of what is the right project and can this fit within their model as well. Um, so again, we'll go to uh, uh, the option four project. Um, you'll see the amounts, how it gets uh, sliced and diced between the county, the borrowed amount you would have, and then again, your town contributed stays the same, and the county contributed uh, column is what changes in, in all of these options. So in a certain sense, you're bringing the same amount in all of the options. It's more of a negotiation with the county on which is the best project and how does it fit within their model for what they have to borrow and their, um, their annual amounts they would get. Uh, I believe all but one of the projects uh, of the towns have had some sort of county, annual county contributed monies because the 7.82 cents that the towns would raise were ultimately not enough to pay for the debt service on what they borrowed on their own. Um, so ultimately, uh, you know, we can look at option five. Again, we slice and dice it up again. The, the impact to the town is relatively the same. All of this is mostly an impact to the county's uh, additional monies as project sizes change. Um, so I guess we would, we would really kind of end up with, um, uh, as, I, as I've said, the town's skin in the game, just like everyone else's skin in the game, is about 7.82 cents. Um, that equates to about a million seventy-four, and uh, I believe you would have you have about a year and a half to figure that out, depending on the ways that you might want to slice and dice that up. And um, it, it really gives you the time to be able to go through and decide if, if that is is what you want to do, and then enter into the negotiations with the county as far as which is the best project that you would want to get. Right. And at a later date, because it, there's, you're spending a lot of time on this and we're trying to get to the macro before we get to the micro later, um, we can help you and show you how the other towns split up their, their 7.82 cents equivalents, some in the MSDs, some town-wide, that sort of thing. We could get into that kind of detail. You have the benefit of an extra year because to do special ops, you have to have MSDs with an MSD, whether or not you tax it or not. Well, that will require some time and effort, of course. And that now that we you really don't make the final decision until June 30th, 2021, that will give time for you if you vote to proceed with a project of this nature. That will give you time to look at the various options, working together with us and the county on where does the money come from, how are we going to raise it internally, can we find any savings out of the budget, or does it all have to come in with revenues, how are we going to find those revenues, would you look at any kind of service fees or others to help raise some, so that we, it would give you time to go through that process, which I think is great for you because everybody didn't have that much time. So I think you've done a really good thing in making your planning be at a level that allows you to think better and longer. The final thing I would say to you, and it's much down the road if you do this, but and, and every town that's done this in the county, once you start it, it never ends. So once your revenues are done, your 7.82 cents and how you raise that money, because after five years, now Max Head went a little longer, thank goodness. It was nice that the estimate was five and it was six or six and a half or seven. But the point is, you got to keep that money coming in because this doesn't end, as you know. It just keeps happening. You make your beach better in five years, you replenish it again, and it's just a come. You establish a new source of revenue. We've encouraged already in talking to the town officials and professionals, you set up your 
your town beach fund. You fund that beach fund consistently. It never goes away. It's used over and over to keep the beach in the circumstances or in the condition that you want it to be in. So this is a lifetime decision rather than a singular decision. And I know you all know that, but I just I want to emphasize that, that it's a, it's a decision made for the future, not just one project. <coughs> In Mag's had the case, they had some fund balance to put toward the project. And that was the beauty of it, because they, they went through the whole project, so they had some fund balance to pay in cash. And so they were able to do that because, the, as, as we said, once you're in the business of beach nourishment, you're in the business of beach nourishment. You hope for the extra time, but you had to get more, more service life out of your, out of your project. Any and, questions? And, and if ahead. it can last longer, as it did down the way, and that just gives you a way to accumulate some fund balances and you might use them some other ways at the beach for access or other things. So uh, the whole beach fund idea and permanently funding, it really gives you a, a way to use money wisely into the future. So, how, go, ahead, go ahead. How confident are you guys uh, that the county is going to sit on that 7.82 number for town skin in the game? Pretty confident. I, well, I, I, I suppose if every town had been done and everything was the same, then it could maybe be looked at. But I, I, it seems to me it was a fair definition when it was done. It was a lot of study, primarily by the county staff and the early towns. I, I'm pretty confident that that stays. Thank you. D didn't one year Nags had waived their MSD? number hmm. okay let's see. I, I think I, I thought I read that somewhere they it was it one for year a short period yeah it's like time. one year they did it for a short period of time because they didn't have a five-year cycle it was going to be a six and a half or seven year cycle okay uh, but I, I think there were lessons <clears throat> learned from that <laughs> there normally are <laughs> And the beauty of it is, because it went longer, I'll say it one more time, you accumulate fund balance so you borrow less. And so, or it would allow you to be a little, do a little bit bigger project the second time if you needed to. So that equity in the fund, and I think because they were first, it just hadn't been thought all the way through in that way. They were the first to end, everybody was happy, it had gone beyond five years. So I think, I think we all learn as you go through, and, and their learning will help you in your learning. So I, I don't envision that happening again. So the, as, I, as I read this, or I, I hear you, I, there's, there's some, some incentive here to not go for the least expensive project. Now let me say this, because <laughs> honesty is always the best policy. <laughs> and uh, one thing you might say about DEC associates is we're always very honest with you. We are advisors to the county as well as advisors to you. Right. So here's what I would say. You have to sell the county on the project that provides the greatest benefit to the community from an economic perspective. What makes your community most economically sound? And how does that blend with what's gone on along the beach in this county? So technically, if you look at the numbers and you put in the same amount of numbers, I see your logic. But you do have to, and, and I, in all fairness to the county, they've got a great system. I, I, I am amazed at the level of knowledge that they have in this, not any other county we know. But I think if the most expensive project is the one that you want and you believe is best for the community and is best for the community at large, meaning all of you who live beside each other, that that's something you should go talk about. But I don't think you should necessarily do that unless it's the right thing. Right. I mean, you could be looking at a $30 million project, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you could make the beach 500 feet wide. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, I think it's a sense of fairness and, 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 and comparativeness to what's going on this far. Thank you, Don. Other questions, Council? Have you, have you done any in investigation in the MSDs for our town? No, none of that work has started because that would require going to the tax administrator or getting, you know, uh, an attorney would have to become involved. And and the contract that the previous council entered in with you included that MSD construction. 
Uh, well, uh, the, we, we speak to you about how you blend your sources between MSDs or taxes at large, but we take very little part in the process to define. We can work with you on defining them. As you know, some of the towns had multiple. Kitty Hawk had multiple MSDs. I think, I think the analysis that we would do slicing it gives and you the dollars it. from yes, it. That's, that's included. That, right. yeah. that's, that's all included on the dollars. So, We'd have to get an attorney to help us lay them out. Yeah. You know, you would have to have a. I understand. I understand that part. It's really the financial right. obligation. Yes. Oh, yeah. But, but yeah, that yeah. is the contract that the previous council yeah, entered. Yes, okay. Yeah, I misunderstood. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I understand going macro to micro. I'd prefer to go micro to macro mm -hmm. and see the mechanism by which we might raise 7.82 cents in tax <laughs> revenue. Um, what, what can we get from that, from you all? Even if it's a, a, a shot in the dark, let's say we carve out the avenues in this way, we carve out oceanfront, or we do a town-wide tax. I mean, that's, that's the kind of deliberative process I was just hoping to enter into here today. Well, well, well I think if y'all want to do that, and you feel that rather than a town-wide, you would want to blend, uh, you could say to us, let's start working on that. We could go to work with staff, uh, look at, how you set aside the district, y'all at least raise a hand and say this is not the final vote that seems fair. Mm -hmm. You know, because it does require um, policy decision. That that could start so that you could determine. And those were somewhat the processes down the way as well. Yeah, and, and the purpose would be to see it as an option rather than to adopt it as a practice. Um, that is correct. Because at this point, we're not quite the same as Kitty Hawk, where there's a clear delineation of the oceanfront value versus the west side of the bypass. Exactly. They've got a there little bit a more territory that reaches in. That's right. And you can't just pick a road. That's there's, correct. There's a little bit more complexity. I think that was the guidance. I mean, what, what, you, what are you all thinking? Would we want to? I'd like to see that information um, sooner rather than later. I think we're caught in a chicken and an egg thing where we're waiting on something from you guys so that we can relay to the town, you know, the general public, how much is this going to cost on your tax bill? Um, so yeah, I agree. But we need to also know, I guess, with, with staff's assistance, how we want to, what we want to recommend as far as how do we, do we want to use MSCs and if so, what areas are we talking about using them in? That's mm -hmm. something we have to furnish, I think, to you. Yeah. I, I, and the tax rates have varied by district yes. based upon where and they it, were. So if you're oceanfront, you get mm -hmm. a rate. If you're one step further back and Second one step road. further back. Yeah, I, think now we, we, I, th I think getting a snapshot of what that looks like on the ground so that we can discuss it. Um, we're going to need a lot of staff help on that for what they think is fair, right, and acceptable. Yeah. Then we can take those numbers, crunch them, and say, if, if you want to split this up 100% to MSDs, this is what it would take. We could bring A, B, C, D, E, yeah. F, G, if you want it. I could draw on a zoning map in about 10 minutes, yeah, a yeah, snapshot. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to right. supersede that, but it, it, I mean, Wes, I don't want to put a burden on you, but I mean, that would be really helpful if you could give them some guidance on or, or get guidance from, I mean, how, how's that going to happen? What do you are you comfortable? With? If council directs me to do so, I will, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I mean, are you comfortable making that decision of what MSD districts to build up, or do you want input from us? I think we could come up with options, but if you want to give us some options, that would certainly be helpful. Okay. Right. What did, uh, how did Kill, Kill Level Hills handle there? God, we can't hear you. I think they did a, a, a town-wide and a first and second row MSD. I believe that's right. Uh, so they had, uh, I believe that's what they did. Um, Nags Head had a first row MSD and a second row MSD and town-wide. So everyone's done some sort of. And what did they do in Duck Camp? I'm trying to remember. I know they did some MSDs, but that, I think they did mostly town-wide. Um, you know, each we can get you all of that. It's all public information. Well, right. So, yeah, you know, I think each, that was, each town decided it, the different ways they needed to, to we, slice we, the dice. We, our family pays taxes in Kitty Hawk. Fairly familiar with the way it carved out there. So <laughs> right. the, uh, really, we're looking at uh, we. You know, I've looked at that, and there's different ways to divide across those towns. Our town is a little bit more complex with geography, That's um, right. and it might not necessarily be as simple as some of the other towns. That's so, right. um, do we want? Do we need a motion to direct staff to coordinate with DEC in developing a potential MSD option? 
I think that's a legitimate time to do that, yes. So if you want to make a motion to that effect, I, we can. I will we make can, that motion. We, we have to give, I may have to give staff an additional time. Yes. I will make a motion to um, have staff begin to initiate um, MSD options with the EC and um, inquire with whatever recommendations are necessary from council. I'll second. Can we put a can we put a date deliverable? Are we going to have yeah, it by like February the fourth, <laughs> or are we going to have it by the next town council meeting? Or we need, do we need to push it so, back to the second meeting in February workshop meeting? Or yeah, or part of the discussion is that is if we're contemplating options or no options, it, that that funding source is as important as anything else, and and what we're going to ask the people in the audience here to potentially pay. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a newly elected individual, and raising taxes is not my key thing in life. Uh, well, they never know. are. <laughs> so I guess we're waiting to hear from both the consultants and staff. What kind of time frame are we you? We can get it to you as soon as possible. I mean, I'm, I can't really commit to a date at this point because we would have to speak about it and come up with a game plan and go from It there. won't be February the 4th. Okay. I don't mean that to sound wrong, but I mean, there's, there's going to be a lot of data. The, the other thing, do you want us... Um, I mean, the guidance could be, what if it was all MSD? Do you want it done by all four of the options? That's the other question. You know, at some point, of course, it's the same amount of money, so that really doesn't matter. Yeah, that, yeah. 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 and I think so, even if you pick the most expensive one, it would be given enough still guidance. Matter. I'm, oh. I'm sorry, you're delivering yeah. the same amount. Yeah, yeah. but, yeah. Yeah, we, we could, um, we can do that fairly quickly. We just have to break them apart. The tax assessor has to give us the assessments. And then we have, because, I mean, there, there's multiple analysis. Yeah. I mean, because y'all are ultimately going to decide. I mean, obviously, if you used a townwide 782, it doesn't matter where you are, you pay the same. In the past, there's been a considerable judgment that those that sit on these new beaches should pay more. And so, basically, that's why in many cases there's been a pairing of townwide to make because the beach does benefit everybody. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is how much of the benefit to everybody comes in the general townwide taxation and then what portion comes to the MSDs and how do you inside the MSDs say the beachfront pays more than the one, the, the one behind it and then the one behind it. So that, that's how we'll have to slice and dice a bit. But th there could be a model put together where I think that there could be some decision making out of y'all, you know, that says, you know, here's that, what we see. To, that, that, I'm sorry, Matt. Well, I was going to say, to clarify the motion, one option would be townwide levy, That's which correct. I can do the math pretty quickly. Pretty easy. Um, <laughs> <made it too. laughs> the, um, the other option would be an oceanfront only levy with a townwide contributing portion. Yeah. And, and then and the a third split, option and a would split be of fifty fifty or seventy five twenty. So you you gotta get your yeah. splits in any of it, unless you're unless you're if you're gonna use town wide option, you don't have to worry about splits, it's town wide. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna use MSD wide, then you don't have to worry about town wide, but you gotta worry about splits between the various right. service districts. Right. Mm -hmm. So at some point in time we're gonna to have to say, is there gonna be a split between town wide? and districts so that we can make calculations along the districts and bring back to you. So y'all need to be thinking about that. It, it, so one option is townwide. Second option, oceanfront and townwide contribution will determine the slips. Third option is three oceanfront districts and townwide contribution. There's a greater contribution from the direct oceanfront. There's a secondary contribution Correct. from those auxiliary to oceanfront Correct. and then there's a townwide mm -hmm. contribution. Correct. That would be the three options. Yeah the MSDs I would start to do and I, I don't want to move without council. Right. Right. Is though you're wanting to know how much they're wanting to come from the townwide portion to yeah. know yeah. which districts. Yeah. At, at some point yeah. in time when we yeah. put together all of this and you get assessed values inside districts, yeah. let's mm -hmm. say there are three of them, then you've got the dynamic that says we've got to raise one million and seventy four thousand dollars a year. So if you're raising none of it from townwide, then we would go into a determination of does half that money come from the beachfront, and then the next thirty. No, I understand. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's point, the general framework that I would like to see. Those okay. three options. Okay. Oh, I got you. Okay. Well, we can develop. If council, if council agrees. Yeah. 
Okay. I, tend to, I tend to agree with those options. Do um, we need a motion? I thought we just had one. He has a motion. I've seconded. Yeah, I, just, we, I just asked about a deliverable date, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and we got off on yeah, this other got, yeah. track. But I was trying to amend the motion so what they would shorten that deliverable date by being pretty clear what we were hoping to see. Is everybody okay with Matt's, Matt's uh, breakdown of the, of the various? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have no problem. Yeah. Well, I think as well. Some guidance. Yes. Three MSDs. Well, three options. The last option has three. Middle has two. First is one. Or a town wide. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and we can you see the funding breakdown and, and the pain that that's going to cause yeah. geographically. Yeah. What happens out of this exercise, just like right up the road in Duck, if I'm pointing the right way, and in other places, once you see the numbers, I mean, once a model is created and you say, let's do just one beachfront and there's no town wide, and so you put the number in there and people have palpitations and you say, that can't happen. <laughs> and so some of it is a palpitation system. And I don't mean that to sound wrong because there's no, there's, this, it isn't easy. Mm -hmm. But I know exactly where you're coming from and I think that could work. Okay. Well, then would it pay for this council to get a Wes and Carter? which option we want to look at a 14 million dollar option or a 16 million dollar option 7.82 7.82 is a bogey yeah yeah i made that error to start with too <laughs> yeah. mr commissioner i mean mr council member i'm sorry it's all the same y'all have to talk the county into how much supplement they're right. going to give you based upon the size of your project right understood so council we have a motion uh, on the floor, which we need to consider. I've got a second of that measure motion, I believe. Yeah, I second it. All, right. yeah. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Motion's made and carried. Do you have the motion, Bonnie, you and, you and Wes? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, could I just ask one question? If this is inappropriate, throw something at me, I can duck. <laughs> um, I understand deliverables, and that's very fair. Y'all really need a decision calendar to be honest we were given one by aptum that's why we're asking about deliverables <laughs> we, we were we were thinking you were going to come with an msd construct that today you you were yes yes because yes. what we had talked about was um in order for us to make an informed decision we need to have the people who pay the property taxes as matt indicated know what amount of pain mm -hmm. they're looking at you know so it, it, again, we, we kind of thought we were going to get there today so we could get that communicated out to the town and then have some time for reflection, yeah. gather comment, yeah. et cetera, yeah. maybe yeah. even have another public forum mm -hmm. yeah. to gather and, more comment and, yeah. um, and then possibly make a decision to proceed or not to proceed right. based on all of that. We did not have that understanding. Clearly. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, it, it was our understanding to go over the 782 cents again. I, I am never going to get ahead of you. I worked <laughs> in government most of my life. And for us to walk in here and say, let's do three districts and this and this, uh -uh. it's ahead of you. And so we, we want to do your wishes. And, and now that we all know you've got to come up with a million and seventy-four thousand dollars then I think your feedback on how you want to get there, and, and I regret that you thought it was coming today. You're talking to some rookies up here too, so, you know, um, I, I'm just. Yeah, we just have to have your guidance because um, <laughs> you're, you're the policy makers, we are not. We're the minions to you. And do you I, have enough guidance from us now though? I do. Okay, and going back to Ms. Morey's question, when can you deliver that? Can you deliver that by our um, that's, that's mid also, that's February also workshop question. meeting? That would be these be a month from now. <laughs> yes, one month from now. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I, I, I do not know how easy the access is to the tax assessor. We, we got it because the tax assessor is not y'all. It's down. So we got to figure out just the dynamics of gathering the data. Running through a model and adding up to a million oh seventy four won't be as hard. Mm -hmm. It's really what it, how fast can the data come? Yeah, we Understood. I don't. Yeah. We don't Do want to. When you'll be able to get us an answer because we're trying to talk to the public here on 
when we'll make a go no go decision. That, that's true, but we don't want to rush it because we're talking about some large dollars that uh, we're going to ask people to. All of us would you be able to talk to the county? I don't want to rush the tax them. department and talk to us early February about, um, and then get by the February council. DEC has the information they need, and then we have our marching orders, and we'll do it as quickly as quickly yeah, as we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to go back to your calendar, and I understand you want to do it as quickly as possible. And so, having heard that, I, we hear where you are. I, I would suggest to you that these decisions will take probably more time than you think mm -hmm. once we get the first data. And I, I would really also focus in on which of the four projects is the yeah. real one you want. Because I don't, I don't think we can spend only our time on a million oh seventy four annually. We got to really start dealing with what is the project we really want. Mm -hmm take that to the county and, and start talking with them about it. Uh, it's so we that's the decision right. we should make we should make today or at next our next meeting. What project we really want to do, try to do. Does it matter? I think it does matter, but again we're chicken and egg. We don't know how much uh, this is going to cost the residents of the town for the fourteen or the sixteen million. You know, we talked about it before. I, I, I really think that we're not ready to make a, a decision today. <laughs> no, no, not today. <laughs> to participate in the 22 nourishment, you need to do design work in March or April of this year. For permit. But we do have an obligation to let the county know where we're, where we're coming from, so they can be they can be including us or not in their in their thinking. seems to me, and um, th this is my old government days, so here goes. It seems to me if we set expectations about what it's going to cost in multiple scenarios to raise a million oh seventy four thousand, and we can get to that place and have some decisions, the question about whether or not the project you really want can be funded shouldn't happen separately. Because in my personal opinion, to say how we get our money, that ought to come at or about the same time that we know the project we're getting the money for. You see what I'm saying? Because no. otherwise you can make decisions on the dollar in hopes of a bigger project, and if the bigger project has come, it just the concept of these a million oh seventy four and the project size isn't readily understandable by everyone, and that's why I would really highly push you working in a framework so that when we introduce what a million of 74 means and multiple alternatives that you've at least gotten along in a good fashion of saying the project we want is the one we think we can right. get agreement with the county. Well, what is the scenario where we choose option one, which excludes the northern end of the beach, and then the northern end of the beach says, well, we'll participate in MSD to pay for the remaining two million to conclude our beat. I mean, it, it, Having the MSD is important for decision-making process. That, that's exactly having, right. having a glance at right. it. And that's the point you just the point you just made is exactly the one I was making, not as articulate as you did. Well, I don't know if it's articulate, but I, I think that's part of the del deliberation that we need to go through. And if, exactly. it, if, if it is a little bit of kickback and we get it's a million seventy-four, but we really want a $30 million project, county only says we're going to give you worth of an 18, 
then we can decide, hey, maybe we want to raise taxes to do the 30 million. I mean, it, it all is an educational <laughs> yes. format. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm being facetious, but it, it's, it's no, part of the decision making it. process. Perfect. So do we want to set a, do we want to set a, a timeline? Do we want to set a time <laughs> where we're going to have this decision made as to what project we want to do? Should well, to, let's go I through the to, process of pitching it to the county. Should term. I talk to the county first and see what they would what they would help us with? How uh, much money they'll give us? Why don't we Why don't we hear from the well, public, public at this point? Well, I'll, 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 yeah. Yeah. Was that was that that's under that? public comment? Here's uh, some of their speaking. Thank you. Do you have everything you need from us though to start working with staff on setting up the municipal district? Y'all, y'all took action to direct us to work with DEC and associates. We have our marching orders, and we'll work with them okay. and the county as quickly as possible. Okay. Is that okay to get back? I'm, to I'm, you? Gonna, I'm gonna do it right there. Public comments. Prior to opening the public uh, co public comment on the public forum, I want to, on Pencil Beach Nursery, I'd like to keep our, our public forum as uncomplicated as we can. Um, just a reminder that today's meeting is being uh, recorded. There's no mandatory time limit on your questions or your inquiry, uh, but I would ask you to limit your comments or questions to a reasonable time out of respect for others here in the audience. Once the forum is open, you should raise your hand if you wish to speak. I will recognize each of you in turn. Uh, you, once, you recognize, once you're recognized, you're expected to come to the podiums and speak so the recording will work. Give your name and address as you normally do and, and tell us to whom your question is, is, is addressed. At this time, I'll open public forum. Ursula? You want to just go off the list? The list is No, you, that's okay. You're, you're, you, I told you to raise your hand. He changed. It's okay. Didn't we'll know we were going to have a list. Yeah. We'll get to everybody. Yeah. You'll all, you all be called on. No worries. Uh, Ursula Bateman, 360 Sea Oaks Trail. Question, and I think I should probably direct it to you. So Ursula, can you talk into the microphone, sweetheart? Oh, is it Michael? Okay. Um, we keep hearing this five year, every five years, or maybe if we're lucky, seven years. <clears throat> I just recently got back from, um, from some of the islands in the Caribbean, and um, I was on St. Thomas, and two years ago they got hit with two Category 5 hurricanes in two weeks. And while down there, and we have relatives that have a house there, they're still rebuilding. Um, in fact, one restaurant we went to was just reopened a month ago. What if we had that scenario here? Would this beach nourishment stand up? Have you ever seen this scenario? Have you had to do it before the five years? And what if that kind of scenario, which it could hit here, what, well, then, then we're looking at a lot of money. So I'm just curious, have you, what is the prognosis for something like that? Absolutely, Ken. So the, this is a situation or scenario that, that folks need to be aware of. Um, what, what typically happens is that one of these projects, when they go in, they, the, 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 the project you build becomes public infrastructure. And so if in a presidentially declared disaster, like a Category 5 would certainly be, sometimes threes and twos and ones are presidentially declared, uh, FEMA, uh, the declaration would be made, and depending on the damages throughout the county, the, the, the town may be eligible to submit for reimbursements of the um, repairs of that project in the same way they would be able to apply for public assistance if the town hall were destroyed in that same, same event. So that process is very formalized. It's, uh, it's something that we understand very well. Uh, it's something that a lot of beach towns have gone through. In fact, um, I think it was Hurricane Matthew that had done some damage due to the Nags Head project um, in 2016. And through that event, um, they had gone through, they determined how much sand was actually lost from the town of Nags Head's project during that. And so when they just put sand on the beach in Nags Head, FEMA actually paid for a portion of that sand that was lost due, due to that declare, the declared disaster. Um, and so that, that's the way that that would work. If there was an event 
um, you know, where a storm came through in year two and, you know, wiped out all of the sand that you had placed. Um, you know, you, there's, some, there's some documentation that you do. You monitor the beach every year. You've got a plan in place. And you can present all that to FEMA once that declaration is made that this is an emergency. FEMA is, you know, can, can assist. And uh, you would make the case to FEMA why you should be eligible for placing that sand that was lost during the event back on your beach. Yes, ma'am. Let's see. No, but. Sure. 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 Thank you, Russian. Can I just say back to Nancy because you said that, Mr. Mayor? FEMA gave uh, an approval for a portion of the sand, and we completed the financing. FEMA doesn't give you the money up front anymore. You have to borrow some money and then once you spend it they'll pay you back and so all of that process was simultaneous so at least in that one case and in others we've seen in North Carolina once FEMA, FEMA approves the money comes yeah FEMA's not building they're just providing the money all right understood I'm going to go back to the list if y'all don't mind I didn't know I had this and you're you're the next speaker <laughs> Greg Greg can go after you go ahead you, si you, were, you signed up on this list after she did. I didn't see the list, so this is it. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Ann Scherzma, 69 Hickory Trail. Uh, first of all, I'd like to correct the um, Carters. The county has not pledged 50% financing of our project, if in fact we have a project. If you go back to the town council meeting of November 6, 2019, when Mr. Outen spoke, he made it very clear that in the beginning they looked at how to equitably contribute from to each town and decided that they could not do 50 percent as they had done in Nags Head. So that's an incorrect assumption that the county is going to be funding 50 percent of a project. Mr. Adam made very clear November 6 and subsequently in speaking to him that the amount available is between seven and eight million dollars. That's it. It's not 50%. It's seven and eight million dollars. And if Avon um, uh, requests some funding, it may be less than seven to eight million dollars. It may be three million dollars, four million dollars. That's a decision that the county is going to make. And I would assume that Mr. Haskett would be in, in communication with Mr. Outen to, to see where we stand on that funding. Um, further, um, uh, we do not have assurances now that Duck, Kitty Hawk, and Kill Devil Hills are all going to be re-nourishing in 2022 or 2023. Um, I believe you're making that assumption, and that's not an assumption you can make. In fact, I talked to Mr. Outen in December. Mr. Albert has talked to him just this week. Um, Kill Devil Hills has indicated that it does not want to go ahead in 2022 and 2023. Kitty Hawk hasn't made up its mind. The one that's furthest along is Duck, but none of them has made a commitment to doing renourishment in 2022, 2023, because they, just like Nags Head, want to extend it out as long as possible. Nags Head did it in 2011, renourished in 2019. If, kid, if they do the same up here, we're looking at 2025 before they might be doing renourishment. That's another thing that needs to be clarified with Mr. Outen. Um, there's no commitment yet. Um, beyond just looking at um, funding, um, it's very discouraging to me that you all seem to be on board um, for beach nourishment when it's not necessary. And it's to me obviously not necessary, except maybe in the northern area, um, where now we're told there's a 57 um, foot uh, wide beach. It, it was less than two years ago that Mr. Wilson came to this, this council and reported on a baseline survey of our beaches from 2017 and said, they're stable, there's no rush to do anything, time is on your side, there are no hot spots. He said that on the, on the basis of data that he had, had, uh, had uh, compiled in 2017. Then, well, let's bring in the S Beach model, let's, um, let's um, uh, factor in these, um, characteristics of an Isabel-type storm, 
and come up with something called storm damage reduction protection. And then let's figure out how much of a volume envelope we need in order to protect our beaches, which are in good shape now, from a theoretical storm of the magnitude of Isabel. Um, I just think it's, um, it's uh, uh, outrageous that you are in the position that you're currently in now to make this kind of, as Mr. Carter said, lifetime decision to basically um, mortgage our town. And before you make such a, a major decision, I would strongly urge you to talk to the real experts, the people who know the coastal environment, not the engineers who use computer models um, and, and cook statistics but do as Mr. Albert said and have a seminar with the folks to the north at the Duck Research Pier and let's hear what they have to say. Um, there's, there's much more data, Ms. Moray, than just what's been presented back to 2001. There's data that goes back into the 70s and there's imagery as well. And I personally have been here since the 60s and I was delighted to see that according to Mr. Um, and Mr. Wilson, the beach where I'm located on the ocean front is up to almost 100 feet in, in uh, width. So why in the world would I, as a taxpayer, want to pay another, what, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a year to, to re-nourish my beach, which is, which is in good shape? Um, I, I think this is all going way too fast without nearly enough expert information and clearly without communication with the county, because the county has said, Mr. Outen said, there will not be 50%. There's seven to $7.5 million available from the Beach Nourishment Fund. And um, I would say don't rush to judgment on this. Give it many more months than you already are talking about giving it. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Craig Albert. Good, after good, good morning, good afternoon again. Tom, she stole my thunder. However, Elizabeth, she mentioned, do we have any surveys from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s? And they do have that at the research center. And they're willing to do this for free. Now, I can't imagine not at least looking to that and uh, hoping that they could give us whatever input they have. If it's free, what do we have to lose? If we really need beach nourishment, they'll tell us we need beach nourishment. If we don't, then we're going to save a whole lot of money, not just now, but in the future. And that's basically all I have to say. So thank, thank you. you. I would say one thing in response to what you said, Ann. The number we were given in February of this past year was $7.6 million. Nobody has told me it's any less than that since that time in my conversations with the county. Okay, I haven't, I haven't, $7.6 million is the number I was given in February of last year. No, Mr. Mr. Uh, and, and gave us a different number? Yes. I, I missed that, I must have, but I thought, I thought the number he'd given, given me was rock solid almost a year ago. Well, the most is $8 million. That's, that's, that's more than $7.6 million. That, that, my point is it's, it, 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 it bounces around a bit, I'm sure, but I, I've been using the number of $7.6 million thinking it was a reasonable number. But my point is it's not $50. No? Unless we're at exactly a certain dollar amount, which allows $7.6 million to be that. No. I, you, we understand that. Dave Bellotti, Belote, I'm sorry, how do you spell, how do you say it? Uh, I got it on the same. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the town council, um, I'm a property owner at 713th Avenue, so right there on the northern edge of the, uh, the presentation, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to address, and I am one who will speak vociferously in favor of beach nourishment and in spending prudent money now to avoid having to spend much more in the future. I'm a native of Virginia Beach. I spent 25 years in the Air Force and was able to retire um, out of a job as the commander of Nellis Air Force Base out in Las Vegas. So I was effectively the county manager of an area the size of Connecticut. and 
got to uh, deal with a number of issues as you guys are, taking a look at uh, engineering projections, trying to figure out what is the best way to manage the risk to our investment. Um, I think it's not correct to say an individual house owner is going to spend five or ten thousand dollars more with that 7.82 property tax uh, bit. It's probably a couple hundred dollars more. I am wholeheartedly willing to do that as a property owner here in Dare County because I stand at the end of the crossover at 13th Avenue, about 120 feet from my driveway. And average high tide line this weekend when I was here over uh, Christmas, when I was here at um, when I was here at uh, Thanksgiving is about 10 or 12 feet from the steps. So I am heartened to see the average uh, or the usable beach um, metric added to the plans that is incredibly you know, valuable to those of us who live up on the or own property up on the northern side. Um, and as someone who has spent four years inside the Pentagon bureaucracy in very senior roles, grappling also with issues like this, how do we spend millions for something that may be a 25-year or 50-year payoff, I would urge you not to fall victim to the analysis paralysis um, and instead remember, I'm going to clean Patton's words up a little bit so that I can say them in public, um, but Patton was very famous for saying a good plan executed effectively now is infinitely preferable to a perfect plan sometime off in the future. All you have to do is stand on our um, beaches up in the north and take a look at what's happened. I've owned this um, property since December of 2010 and I've just watched the beach contract. My parents owned a home on Plover from uh, 1985 through about 2015, 2017. So we've been coming to this stretch of beach between Southern Shores and Duck for 40 straight years. Please uh, invest wisely, but act soon to protect that investment. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Joe Van Giesen. Good afternoon again, Joe. Afternoon already. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had some technical questions for Mr. Wilson. Yes, please. But I have some observations first about the behavior I've just observed up here. It gives me a very bad feeling that it's a foregone conclusion that beach nourishment has already been decided by our town council, and they're figuring out <coughs> negotiating right here in front of the town citizens, uh, negotiating with the advisor on how to finance it, how to set up the terms of an agreement to contract them. That's the, that's the appearance that what I've just observed. Uh, that's the appearance that I'm, I'm seeing. It sounds to me when I hear Mr. Neal say, we're all expecting you to show up with a contract. What do you mean by we? Have you been having conversations about how to engage with TEC uh, in, in a non-public manner? Because that's, that's the impression I get from it. So my point is, you are giving the impression, and people are going to watch this video, are going to get the impression, you guys are just trying to figure out how much money to spend and who's going to, who's going to pay for it. That's what it looks like. So please, be objective. Listen to, the, listen to the people who are asking or begging you to get other opinions. We have someone with an absolute conflict of interest in promoting these projects, sitting here and telling you how much money it's going to cost. We have somebody with an absolute conflict of interest in the projects going forward so they can get paid to tell us how to finance it. Get other opinions, please. For Mr. Wilson, what model validation has been done? What peer review of your SBH model has been uh, done? Where's the documentation for the validation and where's the documentation for the peer review, if any? Secondly, and I admit that I have not had a chance to, to study your reports. I've only had a chance to quickly look at them. What is this usable, uh, sufficient usable beach parameter? What is the number you're using in running these models and determining what volume we need to put in? Is there a number? Is it 100 feet? Is it 80 feet? I, I, you, you probably have it in the report, or you might even have said it today, but I don't know what it is. So could you answer that question also? Uh, 
Yeah, the first one, the, the SPH calibration, um, we went through a very rigorous calibration process uh, that's cited in that first report when we went through the process originally to do a similar study for the town of Duck. Uh, we used all of the, the oceanographic data from the town of Duck or from the, the field research facility. Um, those, those models are difficult to calibrate because you, in order to do it really well, you need data right before and right after a storm with a storm in between, which rarely happens for us as consultants when we're simply modeling or, or running surveys every year to monitor these beach long term. But having the, the, the FRF up there and, and having access to their data we were able to go in and, um, you know, they survey their beach every two weeks with the, the crab up there. Uh, so we were able to go in, pick out some, some data sets, some storms, um, look at the surveys before and after, and do a very robust calibration of that S-beach analysis. It's probably cited in the original document that we submitted in 2018 to the, count, to the town. It, the, the study, the duck study, is probably cited in there, and if you, you know, if you want to get into the weeds, I'm sure the town of Duck would allow you to have that, that document. Um, the sufficient usable beach, like I said, it is, that term it does not have a specific definition, and we did our best to try to come up with uh, an objective criteria on how to determine what sufficient, what, what, what usable beach was first. All right, no, never mind sufficient, what is usable beach? So we chose, we used our discretion to choose to use the distance, the linear distance between where the plus 12 foot contour, topographic contour is, which is about at the base of the dune, down to that plus four foot contour, which is basically the wet dry line on the beach. So for every profile we have, all the way from Duck Southern Shores Town Limit, all the way down through Kill Double Hills, we calculated that width, and that was that, that graph that I showed a couple of different times. And then in order to determine what is sufficient, again, that is a, a subjective decision that we, that we needed to make. Our recommendation was that for the rest of the town that's south of Third Avenue, that if the, if, if, if the public, if the town council, if staff believes that in general that portion of the beach has a sufficient dry sand beach, then that's what we want to use as our model. We want to duplicate that amount of dry sand beach in the northern area, which is how we came up with that, that 30 cubic yards of linear foot. Or the at, so the average in the, yes, that, that, I understand the question now. The average in the overall section of Southern Shores from Third Avenue South if I average all those profiles, that number is about 84 feet. And if I take from 3rd Avenue north, that number is 57 feet, I believe. Is that, I understand that's, that's the current. The current, right, current, the, the, current the current measurements. What, what is the objective? Is there an objective? The, the 84 is the objective. That, that's what we've chosen, that's what we've recommended as, yeah, as something that, to consider. To the town. Sure. Don't leave. Um, it's, it's, more, it's more a request. I am. It's more a request. The profile uh, uh, graphics that you show, the uh, overlays on the, the aerial photographs, obviously they come from some, some data sets. And I don't know if they're available or not, but I would really love to be able to look at the data for each of those years. Sure. And uh, if that's that's possible. It is. It's, put them it's, on the website or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I, I can I can provide a link. It's it's publicly available data through NOAA. Um, they've got a great great interface to yeah, be able but to. You formatted it, set it up for those particular. Uh, the X Y. Yeah. I mean it, it's. I mean you can look at that sort of thing in a in a spatial viewer in GIS in in NOAA's NOAA's website. Uh, but I can. But we can certainly provide the specific. Well, if, they provide, if you can yeah, provide the contours. links, that would be great. Thank you, Ken. Mark Peters. Good afternoon, Mark. Hello, oh, Mark Peters, number two, Seventh Avenue. I am on the ocean front. Good afternoon. Um, I think you all, some of you are aware that I've been involved with this from the beginning. I've said, excuse me, quite a few uh, letters in documented a lot of what's been done in some of the other coastal communities 
And um, w one of the things I'd like to start out with is that I'd like to comment on that gentleman's uh, previous comment about the, the cancer. Um, I think if you get a comment from an oncologist and a radiologist and who's done MRIs and CTs and they say you've got cancer, you've got cancer. Uh, and I think what you need to do at that point is react to it and respond to it. So if I look at this speech nourishment issue and boil it down to its simplest elements, you boil it down to four questions. One is do we have a problem? What do you do about it? How do you pay for it? What are the consequences of inaction? So let's talk about if, whether we have a problem. We know that we have an issue at Pelican Watch. I mean, those houses almost fell into the issue, into the ocean, and we responded with beach nourishment. And we're committed to continuing that program because we know we've lost sand there. We've got the main placement area. We know that's not going to withstand to an Isabel-type storm. We don't have the sufficient volume to withstand that kind of a storm. Are we going to get that storm? Who knows? But we know that we can't withstand that type of storm. The northern beaches, um, 25 years I've owned my property. I've had the opportunity to uh, observe it when we first got the property. Um, I could walk off 75 paces before, uh, before high tide. And I think one of the other people commented that now, the gentleman over here, I've sent you pictures. You know, we're, we're lucky if we have 10 or 15 feet at high tide now. Even today, it was, it was very bad. So I don't think there's any question of whether we have a problem or not. Um, you can look at all the coastal communities to the south of us. Um, most of them in North Carolina have already embarked on a beach nourishment program. So um, is there a problem? Absolutely. I don't, I don't know how we could deny whether there's a problem or not. Um, so what do we do about it? What are our, you know, what are our solutions? Well, again, if we look at what everybody around the country, all coastal communities have done, beach nourishment is the answer. So, um, you know, what, uh, where, do you, where do you go from there? Um, how do you pay for it? Well, DEC has given some solutions, but um, I'm only hearing MSD. And, and I've, I'm an advocate. I'm an oceanfront property. I'm an advocate of MSD. I think we, we should pay for it. Uh, a larger portion of it. But um, I called Ileana Noble of Kitty Hawk back in the spring and I asked them how did they do it. And they set up a beach zone which included businesses and properties closer to the beach and then everybody else paid a different portion. The beach zone folks paid 16 cents per hundred dollars of property value. Everybody else paid four cents. So what does that amount to? Got a million dollar property in the beach zone with the, with the MSD, you're paying about, um, I think it was $1,600 a year. If you're in the back portion at $0.04 cents per $100 of value, you're paying $200 a year. Now, let's talk about the consequence of inaction and, and weigh that against that cost. And that's with everybody, the citizens, picking up the entire cost. Um, the consequences of inaction, 72% of your 2015 and 16 budget was occupancy tax, land use tax, sales tax, and transfer tax, 72%. If we don't do this and all the other beaches are nourishing, we're gonna have an economic impact. Mm -hmm. Tourists will not wanna come to these skinny beaches. Um, I think that's true. You might get people selling their properties and leaving. You might get diminished property values. Um, I think there's a cascading effect of not addressing this. Um, one other thing I just want to say in conclusion is that um, DEC mentioned the MSD model, but in talking with Kitty Hawk, uh, Ms. Noble, she said that they used an MSD model, but they also did other things. They took a larger percentage of the sales tax. Um, they, uh, Topsail Island, for example, applied to a grant. They got a $5 million dollar uh, private grant from an outfit called the Research Institute. Um, and then one other thing to consider is that occupancy tax now is 6%. But uh, someone else mentioned the Virgin Islands. I have, I know people that have properties there and they have no sales tax and no property tax, but they have a 12% occupancy tax. So the visitors are picking up a big portion 
of the cost of their infrastructure support. So that might be something we also want to look at, and I'd like to encourage DEC to look at some of these other options in addition to MSD. Um, but in short, we, we do need to move forward. Um, there's a very evident problem here, uh, documented by these folks as well as people who go to the beach often. So that's all I have to say. Thanks for your time. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Paul Borslino. Good afternoon, Paul. I'm Paul Borsellino. I live at 16 7th Ave, Southern Shores. Um, I'm trying to figure out where to start and what to say today. Um, and, and I guess the two more, most important things I want to say is, first of all, thank you. Thank you for bringing in options four and five that propose, and I'll use the word propose because it's not finalized yet, to nourish all of Southern Shores the beaches to the north. We've told you about those. We've brought you pictures. I think back to one of the pictures that I brought in of the family, you may recall, that had set up their canopy and their tents and their chairs on the dune. I went over to talk to them, and they pointed out to me that the high tide on that particular day this summer was coming up to the edge of the dune. They obviously shouldn't have set up their canopy and their tents and their chairs on the dune, but they said to me there was no place else to sit. They also said to me that next year they're not coming to Southern Shores. They're going to Nags Head. Mark just spoke about tourists will go elsewhere. If there's no beach, they're not going to come to Southern Shores. It seems to me we have to nourish to preserve the beach. So the two things I thought about saying, and they go totally counter to some of the things other people have said. One is thank you for including the option that nourishes all of Southern Shores. The other one is hard for me to say, but I have to say it. Please, hurry up. This problem's not going away. Public forums are going to have the exact same people come in with the same opinions. Nobody's opinion is going to change. If we don't hurry up, or you don't hurry up and make a decision, the money from Dare County will be in jeopardy. My memory of what was said was 50% match up to $7.6 million. So both things were said. If we don't hurry up and do something, some other part of Dare County is going to grab that money. Think about Avon. My understanding, I used to vacation in Avon. They, there were great dunes. I understand the dunes down there have been completely destroyed. I have, haven't been down there to see that, but I've seen some pictures of the water running over the, the dunes and under the houses and onto the, the road. If we don't do something, that's what we'll be facing. It happened in Kitty Hawk. We don't even have to look all the way down in, in Avon. I was just given a newspaper article by my neighbor who lives in Raleigh, who owns the house next door to me. It's the News and Observer from Tuesday, January 14th. There's a big article, Topsail Island, Bogue Banks to get federal funding for beach projects. It has a picture. It talks about the $237 million project that they're looking at, federal money. I guess there's some question about whether we would qualify for federal money or not. I won't go into that now. But the point is, they hadn't done the nourishment when they needed to, to preserve their dunes, and so they got wiped out by a storm. This is talking about $237 million. We don't want to be in that circumstance some number of years from now when a storm does hit. Someone asked the engineer, what would happen if we got one of these storms? Well, you can be sure if we don't nourish and we get one of these storms, it'll be worse than if we do nourish. The nourishment doesn't necessarily save everything from the hurricane. It reduces the impact that the hurricane has. I loved another gentleman's comment quoting 
analysis paralysis. That's what I'm concerned that could happen right now. If you keep asking for more information and more information and more information, the eligibility for the Dare County money will go away. The next storms will start to hit. Things will only get worse if we don't do anything. So let's please not in, get into analysis paralysis. So to summarize, thank you. And please, I don't mean for this to sound disrespectful, but it's the best way I can get across the message. Thank you, and please hurry up. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else wish to speak? If not, I'll close the public forum at this time. Thank you. Council, we have a little bit of business to do here as it relates to our um, first speaker and the decision we're going to have to make about uh, hiring someone to help us with the, uh, with the selection of a candidate for town manager or selection of candidates for town manager. Um, I had originally hoped to make that decision today, but I've been going back and looking through the, through the resumes that I've received. I'd like to have us come to, to the uh, first meeting in February with our, our thoughts about that and hopefully make a motion at that time to hire one of those, one of those firms to work with us. Can I have a motion to that effect? Or should I make the motion? Why don't you make the motion? Yeah, I'll be happy to make that motion. What, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to make a motion that we uh, postpone uh, allocating the, the contract for our firm, consulting firm, until the February 4th council meeting. I'll second it. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Any discussion at all? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. So we'll have our, we'll have made up our mind how we want to, we want to talk about it at that, that time. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say one thing before we, before we adjourn, and I'm, I'm sorry we didn't uh, have, have to say it sooner, but I, I appreciate everyone's comments today. I thought they were, uh, for the most part, appropriate, for the most part, showed uh, respect for the decision we have to make with this beach nourishment project. It's not a minor uh, thing we're talking about doing. We all recognize that. I think everyone in this council, new or old, and I can speak for the old specifically, will tell you that we're not taking it lightly. We're not looking at this like, oh my God, you know, we, we, we don't want to make a mistake and not do anything or make a mistake and do something we shouldn't have done. We're very concerned about it. We're trying our best to do what's in the best interest of our town, the people who live here, and the people, the people that surround us as well, the other towns. I want you to know that. If no further business counsel, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion to adjourn. Can I a second? I have a second? I'll, I'll second. second the motion. All, all in favor. All in favor. Aye. 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 Meetings adjourned.